Hello, everybody. Thank you. Uh, especially thank you for paying $20 to listen to me this evening when you can hear me free any other time. <laughs> uh, I'm normally the city manager, but I want to say first that uh, I'm here tonight just as myself. Um, I'm glad to have uh, further chat with anybody under any one of the hats I wear, but I want to thank all of the folks at TED for putting this together. Particularly want to thank all of you, because I don't have an idea so much tonight as a question for you. And Jason mentioned a moment ago, I just came home, uh, I've got three generations of my family here in Marquette. Uh, we've been here probably the better part of the last 50 years. I was the only one who ever left. And part of coming home for me, uh, in particular, coming home for this job is a little bit of the sense, I think, of what I'm trying to impart to all of you this evening. Uh, of course, the first things that came up when I, when I walked into town were, you know, how's it going? Do you like being home? What are you going to do? <laughs> and so I thought, well, you know, uh, Marquette is the most beautiful place. I've loved it my whole life. I wonder how it's going to remember me. Uh, I started thinking about how do I remember it and why my views would matter. Because in the job I've got, I'm not the king of Marquette. I'm not the dictator of Marquette. My views aren't supposed to matter. Uh, I'm not a political person. You know, if you're a Republican, your streets get plowed. If you're a Democrat, your streets get plowed. So there's really nothing per se about my job, you know, that, and that's the way it should be, you know, that really gives me any kind of power. And so I started having chats with everybody. I went, went around town, I had coffee, I stopped at the library. I just tried to get out and listen to what people said just to kind of get a sense of what their expectations were. And also really just to try to get a sense of what Marquette was because everybody's kind of wondering where we're going to go, what's going to happen next. They see the world, they see all this news, they see the economy the way it is. What are we going to do so that we're going to survive, prosper in perpetuity, and, uh, and become something more than maybe what we are? Those are all pretty big challenges. And so through the course of all that discussion, I decided I was going to try to find one really simple meme that I could use here in the area just to try to get people's arms around it a little bit. And it really came from a lot of conversations with kids, with a lot of people, places like Snowberry, Pine Ridge, people in the coffee houses, really comes down to what is Marquette going to look like at 200? You know, Marquette is right now about 160 some years old, give or take. In 2049, Marquette is going to be 200 years old. And of course, people are asking me, well, what, what's it like to be back? Is it like you remember? And when I was around, Marquette was substantially less than 200 years old. Um, looking at it, uh, it's kind of been a little jarring for me because when I left, I was 18 years old. I moved away. Um, when I look around, it's kind of hard to put into words when you look at the assistant prosecutor at the county today, you know, remembering her taking her snow boots off with Wonder Bread bags on her feet, you know. And so it's a little, little difficult to get my arms around it. But when I tried to do that, I thought, well, you know, this isn't the first challenge that Mark had faced. People have felt like this before doesn't matter if it was at 200 or 50 or 100, whatever it might have been. And uh, when you start taking a look at what would an 18-year-old kid think about Marquette, what would it have been like you know, if, if they were trying to predict where it was, I asked all the folks the same question. right? So if you're in Snowberry, you've been here for 80 years, I said, you know, at 18, did you ever think Marquette would look like it did now? What do you think the, the answer was? Predominantly, I had no idea it was going to look like it, what it did now. It didn't look like this 30 years ago. I couldn't have told you 70 years in the future what Marquette would have looked like, which seems pretty fair because hindsight's usually easier than foresight. So I started thinking, well, you know, if nothing happened, if I completely failed and had to slink out of town, uh, family name in disgrace, you know, generations of family goodwill in Marquette destroyed because of my ineptitude and incompetence, you know. <laughs> Is that, really, you know, is that really what I want to be remembered for? Or, or do I want to uh, take risk, do nothing? You know, what is it like? If I do anything at all, are there natural forces at work that are going to prevail against me? Or if I do nothing at all, are there natural forces at work that are going to make the community succeed, whether I even lift a finger or not? And so I'm here to tell you, thankfully, there are natural forces at work, whether I do anything or not, that are going to carry Marquette forward. Marquette is going to be a city in perpetuity. The only issue is really what kind of city it's going to be in perpetuity. And so to help you kind of get your arms wrapped around that, 
uh, a lot of the discussions Jason mentioned I've, I've had with different kinds of people before are more complex than the story I want to tell this evening. So I, I'm trying to find ways to illustrate it. But if you put yourself back, just for example, to 1830, and I'm, I play these games a lot with myself, with my father, with my, my kids. Uh, air is the most ubiquitous memory there is. You know, Zachary Taylor's grandson is alive today. At some point, a puff of air from his grandfather's voice hit somebody's eardrum, and it got passed down to that kid. That, that's a 200-year span. That puff of air survives today. And so, in thinking about that, you could imagine talking to all these people with these different views of Marquette, it's not too hard to really start talking to people who had grandparents who remember talking to somebody before Marquette actually existed. So when you go back to 1820, the British were actually still in the UP. They owned the East End. They eventually pulled out. And in about 1837, after we fought a war with Ohio and lost, Michigan got us, right? Uh, 1847 or so, Detroit stopped being the capital of Michigan. It switched over to Lansing, and two years later, Marquette started. And it wasn't like it started like you see today. You know, there was no grand wisdom. And in fact, Peter White, the person we revere in history, was about 18 at the time, showed up in a canoe down here on Founders Beach, looked at a completely blank slate, and started chopping trees down. And, and I'm sure if I'd asked him at that time, what's Marquette going to look like at 200, he would have said, thank you, go away. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know what it's going to look like tomorrow, right? And so uh, he was working with a, a blank slate. He had natural forces at work, no government. He had f a, a fertile, virgin land full of resources. He had demand for those products. He brought them to market. He made a lot of money, and we grew. And so 150 years later, those forces still exist. As a government, whatever we do, as people, whatever we do in our community, those forces exist. And think about it like fishing. You know, if, as long as there are trees, there's going to be people cutting them down and doing something with them. As long as there's ore, somebody's going to mine it. As long as there are people who want to buy those products, they will. Unless government intervenes and saves the forest, turns off fossil fuel, promotes wind energy, whatever it might be, very few things government can do to actually stop those natural forces. So when you think about Marquette, where it's been and where it goes, that doesn't really give you a lot, lot to look at. And so when people ask me my view, you know, what's it like to be home? Where are you going to take the city? Uh, I say, well, I'll take the city where it wants to go. Uh, but it's important to remember where it's been. Not necessarily a good predictor of the future. Now. Um, Let's see. We have. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm doing. All right. I'm not familiar with the hieroglyphics of this. Forgive me. So, so the way most people think about Marquette now, if I ask you what's Marquette going to be like at 200, so if I, if you, if my thoughts don't matter, if my memories don't matter, if that's not a predictor then how do other people look at us? If not, if not ourselves, how does the governor look at us? How, how does the president look at us? You hear a lot of things in the paper, but, but how does that compare to, with how we see ourselves? If you ask most people in the room today, what does Marquette look like? They would say something like this. You know, we're a city, 21,000. We're in a county, about 67,000. Uh, it's you know, the Shelbyville versus Springfield mentality when it comes to our sports teams and everybody else. Um, but of course, all that's just local knowledge. Those are local memes that we carry. If you take a look at how the president sees us, and I can tell you that because I actually had a chance to discuss this from time to time when I was in the White House, we're actually, as of 2010, that blue circle. And so instead of being a city of 20,000 people out in the middle of the wilderness that Ohio lost, we're actually a micropolitan area, you'll have seen that word around in the press, of about 22,000 uh, 20, 22, people out of 220,000 people. That blue area, that commuting area, one hour any direction, is now one of only 500 and about 79 micropolitan areas in the United States. So we went from an image of ourselves of about 
Hmm. One in tens of thousands to overnight, statistically, one of only about, let's say, 600, just for give or take. And if you spread that out a little bit more, if you take a look at it from the standpoint of maybe Homeland Security, when they're trying to figure out how to manage their airports, we're actually the principal city in a region of about 370,000 people. You guys feel like that? That's pretty big. You scale up from 20,000 to 380,000, roughly, you know, give or take with visitors, right? Pretty quickly. Well, when you do that, the interesting thing when you're talking to people who have money, whether they're doing revenue sharing, whether they're doing grants, whether they want to invest in the area, which of course speaks to where do you want to go as a community, start taking a look at you a little bit differently. And so when you have 370,000 people, you get a little bit more attention. And so uh, as a micropolitan area now, you can start comparing Marquette to other things like states, like metropolitan areas, other micropolitan areas. And so what do you suppose happens? These natural forces are at work, community of 370,000 people, certain economic output, certain capability, how do we stack up? Well, as it turns out, we're probably underutilized. If you take a look at the basic kind of things that have to do with defining our area, and I won't bore you with all the, the, the dialogue behind it, but if you think about how many people we have, what our natural resources are, what our geography is, how, how closely packed all of these things are and how they come together. Take a look at states. We're bigger than 10 states. We are as big, population-wise, as cities, Grand Rapids, Ann Arbor. Green Bay. And so when you take a look at the economic output of the Upper Peninsula, you could say, you know, if you take a very simple, simple sense, uh, if you have roughly the same amount of something, you should be getting the same amount of output. If you have roughly the same infrastructure, people, technology, universities, diversity of industry, interest in your community, probably we, we've got more of that than anybody else, we should be doing at least as well as anybody else. Well, so, so this area here, as you currently see it, is worth $10 billion a year in economic impact. All of the things we do together, about $10 billion a year worth of economic impact for that space. Vermont, with roughly twice the people, a state in and of itself, has an economic impact of about $26 billion. So even though they have roughly twice as many people, they have almost three times as much output. If you take a look at a state like Wyoming, 550,000 people, UP has about 311,000 people, they have about $380 billion of output to R10. They only have 60% more people than we do. They have almost 400% more productivity and output than we do. Take a look at Green Bay. Green Bay has 308,000 people. We have 311,000 people. We have a lot more resources. We have a lot more opportunity for economic development. Green Bay is a metropolitan community, $15 billion. So Green Bay, this little spot right here, has 50% more economic development, economic activity going on than the entire UP. Well, it'd be easy to say, ask questions, of course, why is that? You know, are they smarter than us? Are they better than us? Do they have better resources? Do they have more things available to them to make this kind of, kind of competition so, so meaningless, leaving us in the dust like they are? And probably not. But the question is absolutely fair to ask. Uh, by the way, Detroit is worth more than Vermont. It's worth 180, million, or 180 billion a year. Vermont is 26 billion. So you know, if, you were, if you're playing risk in the future, you know, go for Detroit, even though they're, in the, even though they're having financial problems. Um, Grand Rapids, for example, 750,000 people, $31 billion. So they've got maybe one and a half times more people than we do, but three times the output. So you say, well, okay, if you're government, you know, and like I get these questions from everybody, you're, you're the city manager, what are we going to do? You know? We didn't even know about that gap before you just told us, now what are you going to do about it? <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and you go to your master plan, which is supposed to be written by the community, and it says, we want a Victoria's Secret in an Old Navy. Okay. 
might not get us to where we want to go. <laughs> but good input. Thank you very kindly. Right? So you sit back and you think, OK, well, if Marquette's going to get anywhere at 200, it'll, it'll definitely get places like that. But you can see we're probably already suboptimized right now, just, just as we currently are. If we don't do something about that, that, that curve's not necessarily going to change. One thing I, that I noticed, and that's the reason why I'm sharing this with all of you this evening, is if I put a circle like this over Green Bay, how many governments do they have in Green Bay? How many jurisdictions? One, Green Bay. If I put a circle like this over, over well, most of the UP, how many jurisdictions do you suppose there are in most of the UP? There's about 70 or 80, right? If we want to become anything in the future, uh, one of the biggest problems we have is uh, in, year, in the year 200, we have to start thinking about how people are going to want to remember us. And one of the first things we need to do is start deciding how we want to remember ourselves. And so next time you see me and you ask me that question, right, my challenge to you is help me help you. Uh, my views don't count. Are we going to be Nagani or are we going to be London? You know, are we going to be Paris or are we going to be Ann Arbor? Are, are we going to be Greece or are we going to be Superior? Right? <laughs> And so uh, with that, I'll leave that question up to you. My office is always open. Thank you very much.